Hi, I'm Marcy Mayer. Had the honor of being at First Congregational Church and being welcomed and loved by you all for a number of years. And let's say it was 6.5 years. <laughs> and I've been given the honor of interviewing a very distinguished member of the congregation and someone who I cherish as a friend. Um, and it is Martha H. Booth, but everyone knows her as Marty. So, hi Marty. Hi Marty. It's good to have doing? you here. Good to Thank see you. you. I'm so glad you're in Minneapolis. It's good for me. It's, yeah, it's good. Um, <clears throat> On, on our way up to Marty's apartment. We're in Marty's apartment. On our way up to Marty's apartment, I met three or four of her friends. One person asked, so how long have you, how long were you associated with uh, First Congregational Church? And I said 6.5 years, and Marty said 65 years. So with that as kind of an intro, let's kind of move into the interview. and. <clears throat> And the first, the first question is, what are some of your first memories of uh, First Congregational United Church of Christ? And maybe you could talk a little bit about when did you become a member, and do you remember who the minister was at the time that, that you joined? I think I have vague memories. We came to Colorado Springs. I was married, and my husband then was called to be the minister of Soap Chapel at Colorado College and mm -hmm. chair of the religion department. And somebody, a faculty wife who was also a minister, said, you have to go to the first congregational. And we said, yes, we will. So we came. But soon in that, and I do not remember who the minister was. It was not memorable. The church was nice and not memorable, yeah. which may be good. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think it was in that first year, the uh, first congregational founded the Broadmoor Community Church. And very early, they had a lot of enthusiasm, no building, but they were meeting in the high school and I asked Harry if he would do services for them in the high school. So we went there and then, and took David with us. David was three. Mm -hmm. And then in the fall, he started services at Show Chapel on Sunday. And I directed the choir. And we took David with us there. So there were a few years there when we were members of the church but not very active. Yeah. yeah. So, so you, you spoke a little bit about what brought you to uh, First Congregational. Um, <clears throat> and you kind of indicated the connection that uh, First Congregational had to um, Colorado College, it did, right? Yeah. And <clears throat> and that's something that that would be interesting to explore. Um, I also wanted to mention, for for folks' benefit, that the David that Marty spoke about here a few minutes ago, or some of you who don't know, is the same David Booth who two or three years ago was the honorary speaker for the James W. White uh, lectureship weekend. That Dr. David Booth. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> would, you, would you care to say any more about that connection between um, the First Congregational Church in its early days and Colorado College? What do you remember about the connection between those two? There were faculty people who came, and we know, and I do think Connie, Rob, and the college are cooperating now, um, something that's not 
at that time, the college was wanting very much to get away from a churchly connection. Mm -hmm. They hired Harry, I think, because they thought, they thought he was liberal and not um, too churchly a person. Mm -hmm. He told me about the faculty then, um, that they were all a bunch of young Turks and very liberal and um, that was good. That was good for him, good for us. Um, but the college was founded by the Congregational Church. Mm -hmm. We were congregational when we came out here. Mm -hmm. So it seemed, we didn't search for churches, it just seemed very natural right. like the, to us. The right place to go. And it's interesting that at that time, I, the church was in my church, in crisis, which I forgot all about because we were um, spawning the Broadmoor Community Church. But there were people in our community who didn't want us to do that. Mm -hmm. And what happened was that some longtime members who lived on the south side of town and Heavy donors, a lot of them, left to become part of the Broadway Community mm -hmm. Church. Mm -hmm. And I can talk to you about founders of the Broadway Community Church. I was proud of that. I was thinking that was a great idea. But there was this thing mm -hmm. going on, which I have seen in our past. Uh, but we recovered. Mm -hmm. And we're recovering. I hadn't thought of that so much, but a lot of people were upset. Wow. That we would let the good people go. Yeah. Out yeah. of the Broadway mm -hmm. community church. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a really interesting mm -hmm. thing to hear about. <clears throat> um, in, a, in a separate conversation, you indicated to me that you had been part of almost everything that that happened at the church at some point, like the choir or uh, here it mentions Plymouth Circle or the church council or being an author, usher or working in the youth programs. Can you talk a little bit about, about that? I did, and most of that is a lot of our current members and it was a long time ago because I don't have that much energy. But, and in 60, one, Harry left, 62, we were officially divorced, and the church, not Colorado College, but the church became uh, more important to me. I taught Sunday school. Uh, for a couple of years, I directed the choir. I sang in the choir. Um, there used to be a whole group of women's groups, and I was president of the Women's Fellowship, which mm -hmm. meant kind of not all at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, somewhere in there, because my job, my profession, was teaching high school music, and I was asked to be the seraph one year. To be the what? Seraph in the mystery. Oh. The head angel in the mystery. The yes. one that wears the red thing. Oh, yeah. And it was a wonderful, as it turned out, a wonderful fit for me because I sang, but I was a choral conductor. And the women who were running the mystery caught on and said, well, would you take these girls, would you? work with them more, mm -hmm. and would you actually conduct them when we gathered together in the sacristy to sing, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. And I did that, and um, there were college girls and high school girls, and um, partying, and I remember 
telling everybody to wiggle her toes and mm -hmm. to clench the candles. So they pass out. It was hot. Yeah. And I did that from the early 60s to the early 80s. Wow. When David met his soon to be wife. And I started Christmas with them. And that's one of the best things I ever did yeah. for the church. And um, there's a reputation about the mystery that you can't change it. You do the same costumes for 150 years or whatever it is. Uh -huh. The same porcelain baby, the same incense thing. That's not true, <laughs> because we used to march in, we, we'd gather in the sacristy and then open the door and I would come out and go three pews worth singing all alone and then the next angel would come every three pews and it was awesome. It was just beautiful <laughs> as a sanctuary filled with music. Yeah. But there were these dead lilies that the seraph had to hold. And Jerry Jordan did not like the dead lilies and insisted that the seraph had to hold real flowers. Uh -huh. So that, that meant a lot to me. And there are still angels from my time who are members of the church now. Yeah. And I always call them my angels. <laughs> it was almost 20 years I, that I did I that. Can, I can see why you would it call them a big response, my angels. angels. Yeah. And I always knew the organist, and the organist couldn't always see what was going on. Yeah. So I had a, a trick, a little communication with the organist, and I would kick her when it was because yeah. the Sarah was standing right up there by the organ. Cup. So Marty, we're back after we were so rudely interrupted <laughs> by the my failure to buy a storage unit in the iCloud. But I, done it. but I think that we have overcome that. So we're going to continue on talking about um, the things that you were involved in, like committees and and uh, groups, etc. You, we covered last before our break. We covered um, the mystery and um, talked about the choir and um, what about other committees or. Um, You've, uh, you've mentioned to me about the dream group and things like that. Oh, the Tell dream us group. about those things. Oh, dream group is <clears throat> really special. Marcy, the, um, I think it was founded about 40 years ago by Ruth Heine and Seal Malik and Ellie Coriel. I think about 40 years a group to get together once a week to discuss dreams. And they've been doing that ever since. And I managed to be a part of that dream group about 35 years ago, every Friday morning without fail, wow. at 7.30 in the morning. And they are deep, close friends. We know each other pretty well. Mm -hmm. And bless Ruth Heine for doing that. Um, speaking of friends, I mean, that's, that's special. And it makes me think of the miracle that the pandemic brought to me of Zoom. Because mm -hmm. it would never have occurred to me that I could do Zoom. But my kids bought me a new laptop and got it all set up for Zoom. So during the pandemic, the dream group, church meetings, church meetings, voting, whatever, mm -hmm. took place on Zoom, which was very easy for me. And then lo and behold, 
I came to St. Paul and I was still Zooming with the dream group and church dreaming. This morning I was at um, Gordon McKay's service, very special. And um, I've gone to annual meetings and things like that. Mm -hmm. So the pandemic brought us some interesting things. That, anyway, dream group, friends, uh, church, Sunday school. I taught Sunday school and summer the you said, education. <clears throat> you said one, one time before that you were on a couple committees <clears throat> Excuse me, and you ended up kicking yourself off the committee. Oh, I, I was years, decades, on OCWM, which is now Mission Giving and Outreach, and I just kept coming. New people came, I kept coming and coming, and there was nothing in writing that I knew of about membership. And Bill Edmondson, who was a friend, um, and I decided we should help. And so we did set up a mission statement. What does mission giving in our words do? A quote from Matthew and uh, membership. So we were on rotation and we rotated ourselves right now. But mm. I love that committee because the church was giving money to worthy organizations and encouraging people to work. Mm -hmm. It was mission giving an outreach, which Polly Hubbard does now. Yeah, yeah. Very good, good friends. In that yeah. Any, anything else that you would want to comment on in the area of committees and groups or teams that you participated in or particularly enjoyed? I enjoyed them all. I think my best friends I made to working together sure. on those committees. And I would encourage anybody else to do that. Um, the church needs it. We try on volunteerism. We love and we're blessed with our staff, who I think about a lot, uh, but we need the volunteers. And I hope about the people now who are working with Connie and with you on the 150th anniversary are working hard, having fun, getting to know each other. Mm -hmm. That's great. Mm -hmm. so, I love the idea of being on a committee. Yeah, that's cool. Um, you've mentioned friends. Uh, can you talk a little bit about some of the friendships that you've had and who were special friends along the line and who were the friends that, that uh, were really special to you when you moved from, from uh, Colorado Springs here back to Minnesota, <clears throat> and and I would just like to say by by way of uh, uh, my outside estimate of the friendships that are created at, at First Congregational, um, when I realized that I could count Marty as a friend, I felt like I had made it, <laughs> just made it. And she mentioned Ruth Heine. And I had the same feeling about her, and I also felt like I could count on Will Green as a, as a friend. And there was a, a lovely period there where I would tell people that I had access to 270 plus years of living <laughs> experience through these three people. So the friendships are amazing. I, I'd love to hear some more about your your friendships. I am. Um, last week, I wanted to go to our church on Zoom and uh, our streaming 
and it wasn't streamed live because of mm. camp out. There weren't enough people there or enough staff to mm -hmm. keep going. And so they sent us back to a link to Leanne's first service, which mm -hmm. was lovely. Mm -hmm. And um, I enjoyed being there. I looked in the front row because it was a film, and I thought, there is Will. Mm -hmm. And that was very exciting to me. And then, mm -hmm. Uh, and I reminisced, and then I thought, who's that sitting next to him? I thought, oh, that's me we're watching. <laughs> that was great. Um, well, we've talked we've talked kind of around the idea of friends, um, and you've had tons of friends, I'm sure, at, at First Congregational over the years. Can you talk about some of the, the friends and and some of those relationships and yeah. things? Some from way back, 1957 um, is when I first came into mm -hmm. the church. Um, Nancy Forge was there, still, or about to be there. So Nancy and I have been friends all these years, and her children, and uh, Marge Murray, and her children. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm very touched and warm, feel warm when I think of Ted Lindemann because his parents were friends of mine. And Ted used to remind me that he sang in my teen choir. Mm -hmm. And I always mm -hmm. called him my teen choir. And Ted Lindemann was a member of the teen choir. Mm -hmm. um, so. Those are fond, fond memories. Yeah. You mentioned that you were speaking on the phone to Connie Robb last night. You, the two of you have been friends for a long, long time, right? Through the church. We met yeah. through the church and we're close friends. I confess, and if anybody in the church is listening to this, um, I have been terrible at keeping in touch with people. I'm since, trying very since you moved here. Since I you, moved yeah. here. I'm trying very hard to settle in here and to meet people here and to learn the routines and mm -hmm. make new friends, um, which I feel is important. And um, when I came here, Connie arranged a card shower for me. A lot of people wrote mm -hmm. beautiful notes, and I've not written back. So I promise everybody I'll write or I'll email yeah. sometime. I'm sure that people but understand. It was very it was hard big, to leave. It's a big a move. Huge move for me yeah. after yeah. 65 years in a community. Right. And it's a good place for me. But I miss those friends, and I miss, yeah. and I have not joined a church here yet. And I, I love the luxury of streaming. Mm -hmm. I'm grateful yeah. for that. But too. you said some really amazing things. I do think the combination it was it somebody Lisa Mason or somebody referred to First Congregational Church. Or maybe Ben had heard people refer to the church as mm -hmm. that church. And I loved being that church. Mm -hmm. I think I had a certain amount of hubris related to that, a certain mm -hmm. amount of pride. I love our outreach, our reputation for being a just peace church or mm -hmm. open and affirming a Micah 6 church, mm -hmm. um, and that's really important. But I feel if within the church community, if we don't maintain that kindness to each other, the sort of thing that Margaret Weimer and Agnes Keo Mm -hmm. do or during the pandemic when a group of people 
a committee, probably, were going to homes and delivering flowers. Mm -hmm. They were kindness moms. Mm -hmm. Delivering. That was that was Ruth Heine that started that. That was so kind yeah. and good. And in the crises that we've had, and there was a crisis going on when I entered, and there have been crises in the past 20 years. Very often, my feeling about the crisis was that we are just being mean to each other. Mm. And people were stamping their feet and pouting and leaving. And I stayed, and I kept thinking, well, get through this. Let's, let's take care of each other. We have been, we have said unkind things about each other. We have done unkind things to other people. And that's not what the church means to me. And we've had good preachers and very good preachers and great preachers. But that's not the only thing that the mm -hmm. church is. And I wish we would remember that and be patient. I do think that I'm, as I probably exhibited, slow about using any liturgical vocabulary. I'm terrible. A friend here talked about the Holy Spirit working through her. And I was using the word, you are a channel. Um, so I'm not very churchy, but I have loved this church for 65 years mm -hmm. and the community. And when I enter through the founder's room and somebody greets me with a hug, I'm happy to be there mm -hmm. with my friend. Mm -hmm. I often find the sermon both comforting and agitating. One of my fondest memories is young Ben Broadbent preaching when Jim was on sabbatical the Sunday after 9-11. Mm -hmm. And Ben was young, and I, I don't remember, 25, 26. It was profound. It was really good. And never, it was full of comfort, but never totally gave up his feeling about the way the United States had been behaving in the world. So there was this incredible spirituality and acceptance of the role that we play in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, this very mm. moving. And I find that almost every Sunday, a prod and a comfort, and I need both. Mm -hmm. So I'm still streaming, <laughs> still a member of the church. And I do think I said before we were interrupted, um, that with Leanne's wonderful, warm um, optimism, as she goes through her own life crises, mm -hmm. that she's always comforting and optimistic. There's a sunniness about her mm -hmm. and an optimism. And I remember hearing from Josh in some sort of um, the word hope, which has now become my big word. I have mm -hmm. grace. Grace is my favorite word. But Josh was preaching, and he started low, and he said, "It's not too late. It's not too late." And before he was through, Josh was shouting. He was screaming, "It's not!" too late, and I believe him. So the faith, the hope, 
and the love, the, the charity, mercy, love, whatever charity mm -hmm. means. Um, those are important. And another word that's really important to me that I learned from Paul Tatter, who was a retired minister, who was our minister of visitation, Paul Tatter, um, preached about grace and what grace means. And grace is really my favorite word because mm -hmm. it includes grateful, gratitude, gracious, graceful, just grace. Um, what kind of advice would you give to First Congregational United Church of Christ as they look forward to another 150 years of being a community, being the <clears throat> the manifestation of 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 God's work, and what would you say to them about? I mean, you said okay. a minute ago, uh, maybe when we were filming or not, <laughs> that that being kind to one another and not acting like a bunch of spoiled children who stamp their feet and My pout. Mm -hmm. um, that seemed to be pretty good advice, but I, I, a person like you surely has some other advice for a group who is looking at 150 years of hopefulness in, in the future. I'm not an administrator, and I'm not a historian. Um, I, I think that to maintain these two things, to be a church community that cares for itself or for its members, like a family, a family would do that. To, re to stay strong so that it can work in the community to help people with greater problems um, is very important. Without that outreach, because I think for this particular church, I can see people who uh, like to be in different kinds of organizations. But this church, I think, can continue to be that church that has a strong outreach, but only if it has the integrity of being itself, of being strong. And when things go wrong, Stamping your feet and marching out is not a way to help. It's, mm -hmm. And I'm talking about some of my best friends who left in anger or who said cruel things about other people. And that doesn't help, I think, um, work. And listening. If somebody is doing something that you don't like, I think listening to that person and not offering all of your p perfect opinions. I, mean, I know I'm right, you're wrong, so listen to me and you'll get it. That <laughs> doesn't work. And, the idea, speaking of Zoom, the idea that you and Dr. Don started this Zoom conversation about Micah 6, what it means to be a Micah 6 community, is very important. Mm. And that little group <clears throat> continues. Yeah. And mostly yep. we just chat. We're just friends, Ardeth and Royce. And yeah. Connie and Agnes and Margaret. It was fun. Yeah. yeah. 
that <clears throat> that was a that was a pleasure to be part of that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Well, we had a, a pretty wide-ranging conversation, and um, I'm hoping that we have provided enough of s the snippets of <laughs> your wisdom and your stories that I have heard, and and we've been able to record some of it. <laughs> sadly, some of it, and some of the stuff you know, fell on the floor and I'm going to sweep it up at the end and take it home and listen to it again. Ha ha. Um, is there anything else that you would like to say um, that comes from an investment of 65 years? Well, I think I've been investment more a recipient of the good in the church community. Um, and certainly in the last few years, except for friendship, I have not been able to contribute much to the church. And I certainly can't see for 150 years what, what will happen in Colorado Springs or in the church. But, I think having strong leadership is helpful and really good. And we have had some really wonderful leaders um, and some less than wonderful leaders, but that's not what the church is, particularly a congregational church. Um, I think what Bill Kemp did when he was monitor, moderator, <laughs> president. Sometimes <laughs> he was monitoring. <laughs> <laughs> um, through Zoom meetings and budget meetings and being transparent and letting us express our opinions and ask our questions and talk about our fears was enormously helpful. I think mm -hmm. just wonderful, and maybe Zoom, maybe technical things will help more. Um, I have no idea what the future holds, except I think we can still be kind and mm -hmm. generous and take care of each other. It's a family. It is a family. We talked. We talked a few minutes ago, and I don't know whether this was on tape before or not. But <laughs> when I went there, I, I would just feel better when I walked in. And you said, I don't know if it's on tape or not, but <clears throat> you said I, <clears throat> I had been going almost selfishly to see my friends. And my response to that was, everyone is going there <laughs> selfishly to be with those people who are part of this body of Christ, mm -hmm. this fabric of, of godliness that, that that community is. And so, not selfish. We we're all going there because we wanted to be with our people mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and be with another little part of God in that yeah. nice fabric. So And like a family, and it's not exclusive. When I say let's take care of each other, I just mean if we're not being kind to each other and helping each other, there is no way we'll be strong enough to have this outreach yeah, that makes right. us that church. And you, Marcy, and the, the idea of, speaking of budgets, which I suddenly decided to talk about, the idea of burning a mortgage 
that was as old as mm. this mortgage changed the budget enormously and that that you could a small group of people could raise enough money from everyone to get rid of that mortgage. It's just amazing. That was awesome, wasn't it? Oh, that yeah. was awesome. Yeah. And it worked. So <clears throat> there is a glorious sign of that never never doubt that a small group of mm. pe people, determined people, yeah. well, I think she talked about a group of gray haired ladies who could change the world. But that happened in our church. Yeah. And people were kind and generous and good. And people gave five dollars or my friend Karen contributed. And um that was amazing. Yeah. And a huge chunk of interest money out of every year's budget. Mm -hmm. Huge. You were part of that. Yes, yeah, you were. Well, this is this has been an, an amazing opportunity. I'm the <laughs> one that benefits the most because I now know even more about why Marty is so such an amazing person and has been such a critical and significant part of uh, the first congregational community and. Um, Thank you for giving me the opportunity to do this. Thank you for being my friend and thank you for being such an amazing part of of the community of First Congregational United Church of Christ, Colorado Springs. Thank you, Martin, for doing this. Thank you for your patience, for your patience with me and your Patience with technology. Yeah, with technology. And you're yeah. smart. And thank you, First Congregational Church, for all you've given us. Thanks. Great. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. Mm -hmm.